we try to put something out now and then that we call the SFR Pulse, which is just one team's experience uh, in the last week or so in the SFR business, single family rental, institutional. Uh, so a couple of things to share that are, um, that are very interesting as we round the corner. We're now well into 2021, end of January, and a couple of highlights. One is that there are, in fact, new players that have come into the space. They were kind of sniffing around a year ago. Now they're, they're hot and heavy. They're taking positions. They're choosing partners. They're choosing property management acquisition partners. Uh, the business, the second wave of, of institutional SFR is definitely underway. First wave was eight or 10 years ago, led by companies like Invitation Homes, American Homes for Rent, Waypoint Starwood, American Residential Properties, Silver Bay, Tricon, First Key, I'm probably missing a few. The second wave now is, uh, is very, very interesting because those companies prove the model that large scale SFR works, uh, the, the public markets like it, the bond markets like it, and the new players that are coming in have something we've been looking forward to for a long time, which is a diversity of strategy people coming in who have uh, different geographies in mind than the core 10 or 12 SFR markets, secondary markets, tertiary markets, outlying suburbs are becoming attractive because the, 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 the rapid migration that COVID created, you know, it, it didn't create so much new migration, I don't think, as, as accelerated migration down to these markets and, and out to new places. So, diversity strategy also on a few clients doing something that I'm really happy to hear about, which is an emphasis not as much on yield and more on price appreciation. Because when you focus on yield, sometimes you get pulled into a lower quality asset, where if you focus on price appreciation, you tend to get pulled to a higher quality asset, higher quality neighborhood that are always in demand, growing demand, best schools, low crime, higher price points, higher net rents, but um, lower yield, but better appreciation. So that's all happening. Uh, new players coming in with a, a real enthusiasm for single family rentals. And so if you're somebody who's in the real estate business, uh, this is something you might wanna pay attention to because when I say real estate business, I mean the real estate sales business. Uh, you should check out more about what we're talking about here because we are developing specialists to service these clients. We have the training and we have the clients and in some cases we need real estate agents, practitioners on the ground to learn this craft. We're happy to teach it to you and we're happy to um, include you in our client work uh, and that'll get you off the, off the ground with a pretty robust SFR uh, business. Um, so that's the first piece. Now the second piece is that prices are driving up. Um, again, COVID created a real estate boom. Who would have thought that would happen, but it did. It's continuing. And what's happening is home buyers that are much less market rate sensitive, market price sensitive, and much more, I need to get a place sensitive, right? I'm leaving New York, I'm coming to Florida, I need to find a house, there's only three on the market in the neighborhood I want, I'm gonna pay what it takes to, to get that house. That surge in demand drives prices up and the rents are lagging. So what you're seeing is as values drive and rents don't quite keep up, the yields are compressing. And so a lot of investors are saying, well, I wanted to get a 5.5% yield, but now in this market, I'm looking at 4.9, which I'm not happy about. The question that they need to be asking themselves, and they are, is if, if I buy the house right now at the price I can get it for right now and the rents aren't catching up, in a year, am I at that 5.2% net yield because I was able to push the rents up and the market rents did catch up? So people are starting to have to think in terms of the dimension of time if I buy a house in January and I overpay for it, did I get the right price when I'm looking back in May? In other words, should I pay a, should I pay a, a May price for a January house? For some investors, that logic makes sense because uh, you're not gonna buy the house. The house is gonna be worth what you would have paid for it in January in just a few months, uh, and then you wish you had bought it because now you have to pay that price or even more to get it in May, and you need to be thinking about a July price for a May acquisition, maybe. So people are open-minded because when you have a lot of capital raised, you have to deploy that capital. And for those that don't have a lot of experience with institutional capital, think of it this way, it's real simple. If I have a billion dollars committed and I have expectations of a certain return on that billion dollars to my investors and the money stays dormant for a better part of six months, I'm not gonna make my numbers. And so getting a lower return earlier is in some cases better than getting no return while you wait for the higher return because you're going to have an average over the first year that looks pretty dismal if you can't deploy the capital. 
and folks don't want to give the capital back after they've raised it. So you're seeing a certain flexibility on what their buying criteria is based upon what the realities of the market are on the ground, which I, which I think is totally appropriate. Uh, so prices are driving, rents aren't keeping up, and investors are adjusting based upon the time dimension there to try to make that reality work for their buy criteria. Um, and the third thing is, is watching closely as everybody is with COVID as it appears to be winding down. Okay, we're in a different season now, a uh, different political season, a different media season. You're already starting to see a lot of optimism about uh, the vaccine. The vaccines are being delivered. People are feeling more comfortable. Um, we're starting to not see it yet, but sense that everything from states and cities and colleges, um, places that have very heavy focus on what their lockdown plan was, are now starting to hint that they may start talking about their reopening plan. Okay, some states had a reopening plan early on. A lot of states weren't willing to really talk much about that because they were playing it safer. Um, but now you're starting to see people acknowledge that a reopening plan is the responsible thing to do. I haven't heard it yet, but I'm expecting to start hearing it. Little things like my daughter is a freshman in college. Her school is really rigid about their policy and about enforcing it. Like have a party, get expelled is the, po the policy that has been implemented there. Um, they're pretty strict. But they had a bonfire last Friday, and they invited everybody out, and they weren't whacking people with a flogging stick if they got too close to somebody else. Um, so the social distancing is starting to relax a little bit. They were wearing masks, but they're starting to pay a closer attention in that little microcosm of that university, paying a little more attention to the quality of the student experience, keeping everybody safe and keeping everybody living a high-quality life is what the balance is now, So, or at least beginning to be. So. How does that impact housing? I think what it means is that the, the mad migration cools off a little bit. Doesn't stop. People like working from home. Companies like not paying office rent. Some of those things I think are permanent fixtures now. Uh, but the escape from New York phenomenon is cooling off. People are already starting to move back in again because they see a good opportunity to get a low rent lease, to get a, a cheaper condo. Um, and again, so that how that plays out for SFR is maybe the home buyers cool their heels a little bit and leave some houses out there for the investors to buy. So we're hopeful about that. We're watching it very closely. And this pulse is always about trying to give you information from the field that will show up in the statistics months from now, right? Stats are rear looking. You know, if I look at stats for January in a couple of weeks, those are talking about transactions that got done back in October or November. It's all rear facing. If you want to know what's coming, you have to have your finger on the pulse of how people are behaving and how they're thinking right now. Because their thinking affects their behavior, affects the prices they pay for houses, affects the stats that come out in April. Okay, hope that was helpful. Thanks for watching.